where are this morning. Please rise as we sing, Your Grace is Enough. One, two, three, and. Come on, clap your hands. yell hallelujah like I yelled hallelujah in the middle of the song that's not just to say hallelujah that's a word do you know what that means praise you God I don't know if you know how that's what hallelujah means praise you God yay. yay so as we're thanking him for his grace we praise him too and this one Zephaniah three seventeen says the Lord your God is living among you a mighty one who will save he will take delight in you with gladness with his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with grateful songs. He is mighty to save. Amen.
needs compassion. Your 
Other name. 
now we just thank you so much we can come there every week and just praise your name we are honored to do that 
We just thank you for this ministry and everyone that's in it. Now we just ask that you be with Pastor Eddie as he brings the message. In your name we pray this. Amen. Well, hello, New Hope. Let's give him a shout of praise because he's worthy. Amen. Well, listen, do me a favor, turn around, greet someone, say hello, make a friend, invite somebody out to lunch. Be the best decision you'll ever make. Listen, if you're in middle school or high school, uh, my left, your right, there's Anthony in the back with his hands. You can head out to your classes. They're going to have tons of fun. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. Well, let me just welcome everyone, and uh, especially our first-time guest and returning guests. And I want our first-time guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. And uh, I'm telling you, there isn't probably any greater sense of meaning and purpose is when you and I tap in to God's presence and allow him to use us to bring radical change and life-transforming change, not only in our own life, but in others. And uh, I tell you, it is an absolute gift and a joy. And so... Uh, if you wouldn't mind just quickly pulling out this weekend program, uh, I'm just going to hit a few things real quick. If you don't have a weekend program, just raise your hand. Uh, we'll have our ushers make sure you get one. That'd be awesome. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, in your weekend program, there's this uh, pink connection card, if you wouldn't mind pulling that out. And some of you might be saying, well, you know, Eddie, listen, you know, I, I, how do I connect here? How do I get involved? How do I use my gifts and talents? You know, how do I you know, begin to, to allow God to use me. I'm telling you, the first thing to do, the first step is to take a moment. There's pens right in front of you in, those, in the little pockets in the seats in front of you. And there's a pen there. Just fill this out, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. The name, email, because a bulk of our communication is done. Email, Facebook, website. And we just can't get everything in the weekend program. We got the bullets in here, uh, but we don't want to make it a magazine. And there's just so much going on. And so uh, there's also... Uh, uh, opportunities there for you to uh, sign up for uh, uh, many of the different events that are going on. Uh, there might be uh, some, some great opportunities to serve. This is the reason why your email is very important. We're not going to sell it. Uh, let me tell you, my, as well as for my, our, our regulars, um, if you haven't gotten an email from me uh, this week, then you're probably not on our list, and we had a hard time reading your Greek and Aramaic when you wrote it there. And so we probably goofed it up when we put it in the computer. So take a moment and fill that out for me again. That'd be awesome. And I'd really appreciate that. But let me, let me just say that uh, the, the main thing on this connection card is the back prayer request. And uh, I'm telling you, God is unbelievably faithful in desiring his children to come to him in prayer. And we want you to know that you're not alone and that uh, many of you might be going through some some terrible circumstances, or maybe you even have a praise report of what God has done. We want to hear that too. And a matter of fact, I got a whole sheet of praise reports from what you guys wrote uh, the week past. And so I just want to kind of thank you for that. And um, I'm going to read just a few of the praise reports that, uh, that have come in. And uh, the, first one, um, uh, the first one is that uh, uh, Patrick found a job. He's been praying for a job, and God provided him a job. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Uh, matter of fact, we have another one here for a job that God provided. That's awesome. Um, 
Uh, I have a praise report here that, uh, praise God, no cancer. All tests came back, no cancer. <laughs> praise the Lord. Awesome. Then uh, another, another praise report uh, that, uh, thank you for all your prayers. Cindy's colonoscopy showed no cancer or polyps. I mean, polyps. All right. Uh, I, I, you know, God... God is real, he's alive, and he answers prayer. And so just take a moment, fill that out. Uh, and then anytime you're in and out of the worship center here, you can put it in one of those offering boxes. And I'm just going to quickly say about the offering boxes that, um, listen, <clears throat> this offering uh, is for those of us who consider New Hope our home. And uh, we really see that God uh, is really burning our heart with a passion to impact the world around us. If you're a first-time guest, returning guest, listen, our goal is that you would have an encounter with God that would be life-transforming. And so we love you. We thank you here. And uh, it's a free will offering. So there won't be no plates being passed. Just feel free. Whatever put the Lord puts on your heart to do. If the Lord is tugging at your heart, I'll tell you, obey God. And uh, don't worry what I have to say. He's more important. Amen? All right. Where are my little guys? Come on. Woo-hoo. Oh boy, I tell you. All the time. That means I'm alive. Hey, beautiful. Oh, there are, they are. Well, listen, we love children here. And uh, let me just uh, give a big uh, shout out and a, and a, and a thanks. And a pr another praise report is that all the inspections came in. And uh, our modules are up and running. They're good to go. Woo! And uh, I tell you, man, that has been one journey. And uh, we're excited about that and excited about what God's going to do as he's opened up a whole huge amount of space for us uh, to really begin to impact more people's lives. And so, uh, listen, we, I, I want you to know that um, we have no expectation that three, four, and five-year-olds are going to act like 40 and 50-year-olds. Uh, kids are going to act as they are, and so they have freedom here, and, and so they're going to move around and jump and talk, and, and that's okay because we love them. And Jesus had to rebuke the disciples from hindering the little ones from coming, and so that's the reason why we bring them up front because we want to, uh, in a similar way, say, listen, children are welcome here, and uh, we don't expect them to be adults when they're kids, and, uh, you know, it's just a beautiful thing, amen? See, and he's excited for mama. So let's just pray. Let's just extend our hands, and we're going to pray a blessing over them. Father, thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you what a gift they are. We pray, Father God, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for all the mamas and all the papas in the room, and thank you, Lord, for bringing the children. And Father, thank you, Lord, for all our servant volunteers, and Father, uh, those uh, teachers and, 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 and those who prepared lessons all week long to invest in our children. Not only our children, but our youth as well, our middle and high schoolers that are in their classes. I thank you, Father, for all that you're doing in them and through them. And may they, they learn the deep truths of God and walk with you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, get, shout for Jesus, man. That's a great thing to do. watching you for a while now. You're different. Now, don't let anyone tell you that you have nothing to offer. Second chances don't come around all that often. I suggest you take a really close look at it. This is your chance to earn that look in your daughter's eyes, to become the hero that she already thinks you are. 
It's not about saving our world. It's about saving theirs. Scott, I need you to be the ant man. to change the name <laughs> all right well listen uh, before we begin let's uh, pause and invite the Holy Spirit to come to teach us what he would want us to learn through the ancient truths of the Bible amen let's uh, bow our heads and pray hallelujah father God Lord as Lord, we have gathered here today Lord Father, many of us have made huge plans and major resolutions. And Lord, oftentimes, Lord, we are just burnt out when we don't keep them. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, for every single one of us in this room, Lord, teach us. Teach us, Lord, to set the tone of a new season of empowerment in our lives, oh God, that only you can give. Father, because... Small things, Lord, make huge differences. And so I pray, Father God, Lord, that if anybody here in this room, Lord, is feeling small and insignificant, Lord, I pray, Father God, that you would give them a revelation, Father, of yourself and how you have purposed them. And, Father, that we would leave here empowered in your name. We ask, amen. In the movie, Ant-Man, Hank Pym, who's one of the main characters, says to Ant-Man, everyone deserves a shot at redemption. I mean, that's actually, I think that's probably one of the, the big catalytic themes in the Bible. And so consider how God's story in the Bible brings about redemption. I mean, think about how, how God has orchestrated and, and the whole universe, this whole redemptive plan, and he did it by the king of kings, who is the, the author of all the universe, to be born as a little, little bitty baby in a small, little, little manger amidst the stench and the filth of animals. See, I think here's the principle. It's often... Times that small things that no one else sees results in the big things that everybody wants. And for this reason is why we are kicking off today our summer series called God on Film, where the scripture is, provides the text and the movies provide the context as we're going to examine stories in our culture and we're going to compare fact from fiction. We're going to contrast faith in movies with God's story in the Bible. Now, why do we do that? Because this is what I've learned. And I think that probably many here in the room would would have a, a, a similar epiphany. That movies are really shaping our culture. Our generation, my generation, the next generation, the younger generation, are getting their ideology, their, their sense of moral right and wrong, and, and, and what they believe is right in the, from a movie. And if we don't speak truth into the culture, we're going to raise up a generation that's going to actually believe Hollywood over God's spoken word. So as we examine today's scriptures, let's, let's explore a life that God rewards. Because the power of a focused life Think about that. The power of a focused life 
does not despise small beginnings. I believe this is best understood when you and I consider how God loves to use small things like a song or a teenage girl or a star or a cup of water or a few coins from an old widow or a mustard seed to accomplish great things. See, God constantly is using itty-bitty small things and he accomplishes extraordinary things to prove that he is the God of the universe for his glory and his majesty. And you and I have this sacred opportunity, this sacred privilege to be able to participate and to be used by God in an unbelievable way. And so, why, and, why is this so important and how is this even possible? And first and foremost... What I want to suggest to you is by learning that succeeding at the big things has to do with the little things. Think about that for a second. Succeeding at the big things has to do with the little things. And so in today's scripture passage, we're going to see three key elements of the power of a focused life that produces a life that God rewards. Now, I think many, many times we kind of miss the absolute life-changing supernatural impact that these small things that God wants you and me to be faithful to and how absolutely important that these things have in our destiny in life. And uh, we're going to look at that in, uh, in today's passage. And I'm going to give you the three key elements in, the, in this life, this, this power, this focused life. The first key ingredient is by the will of small people. And we're going to talk about that, the will of small people. The second ingredient is by the words of of small numbers. I'm going to talk about that. And third, by the works of small gifts. Okay? So we're going to see about the will, words, and the works. And specifically, the connection of how that allows you and me to live a, a powerful, focused life that produces a life that God rewards. So let's go to the... Uh, Let's go to the scripture. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 6, and we'll be reading from verse 6. Um, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. So let me just kind of pause here for a second and say, okay, why does God want you and me to go to the ant? What's significant about an ant? I mean, what characteristics, what is there about an ant that can have any particular meaning? And I, I think it, for many of us, it passes us by, and I believe that's why many of us really never reach God's potential in our life because we don't pause for a moment. And as... We look at what God told us to do here. So look at, look at what it means to go to the ant. And I want to suggest to you, this is where I believe the principle, the, the character is the will of small people. What do I mean by that? I, mean, I believe that there's too many of us in this room right now who in our minds, in our thoughts, we are living beneath what God has called us to. That you and I are living somebody else's dream. We're living under somebody else's shadow. Our thoughts that we've gotten from maybe our family, our parents, our aunts, our uncles, our culture, is basically saying you're a nobody. You're a nobody. You're never going to amount to anything. Some of us have heard all kinds of ideas. We, we have such a low sense of self-esteem. I'm insignificant. Like an ant, right? 
And what ends up happening is that as we're thinking that, as our will is saying that, the reality is that ultimately we have to realize that it's impacting our future. It's impacting our destiny. I want you and me to consider that our destiny from the perspective of a, of a focused life, that that really is a success. That when you look at the characteristic of an ant and why God calls us to go and look at it, because you see one individual... And this ant is able to accomplish some of the most extraordinary things. You ever watch like an ant colony? Have you ever watched ants? I mean, they're pulling like 10 times more of their weight. I mean, they're, they're able to, to do just things that are just amazing. But what's even more significant about an individual ant is the fact that in a colony, in a group, they're able to do 100 times more together than they could ever do alone. And many of us... Because of our will, the will of small people, because we're, we're, we're living under the, the shadow of someone else, we're living, we're living the lie, we're living the half-truth, we're, 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 we're putting our, our, our own lives in the hands of someone else who has a very small view of us. And I want you to know that your Heavenly Father doesn't have that view of you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in God. You are the apple of his eye. He rejoices over you with singing. That since you were being formed in your mother's womb, God has prepared a work and a destiny for your life. And too many of us, I believe, we just don't like smallness. See, I, I, I'll just talk about myself. I, I can't stand you know, starting small. I mean, I, I hate starting a new job and starting on the bottom. I hate that. I mean, I, anybody? I mean, oh, I've got to prove myself, you know. I mean, why can't I just kind of like jump to the top? Why can't I just be the CEO? I think I'm smart enough. I mean, I just, I hate, I, I want to I, I wanna be a massive athlete and I don't want to exercise. I mean, who wants... I want to skip all that. I mean, I want to skip the sweat and the work, and I just want to be an athlete. I mean, I want to be a Mozart, and I don't want to practice. I mean, I want to play instruments, and I want to be a musician. And, I, you know, I mean, I'm all, you know, my, my hand, I'm playing guitar, they bleed. You know, my, my wrist get hard drumming. I mean, you know, my, my wrist bend when I'm playing the keyboard. I don't, I don't want any of that. I just want to, I want to just jump to the top. I hate smallness. I think there's many of us in the room might feel in a similar way. I just want to jump to the top. And all I want to say is that for many years, I was starving my own destiny from the attention that it needed for me to eventually get to a place where I could be a master in music or I could be an athlete or I could be, you know, um, you know a pro ball player or pro football player, or soccer, or tennis, or whatever particular sport you like. I just wish I didn't have to, like, diet and exercise to lose weight. I just, you know, just, just, just go. You know what I mean, hey, who wants to start? You know what I mean? You know, little weights and then get up and running around. But you see, it's, this is the key. And the, and the key is that it's all the small things that nobody sees that often produces the big thing that everybody wants. Everybody wants the top. Everybody wants the success. Everybody wants to be the, 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 the master player, the, 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 the Olympian. I want to be an Olympian athlete, and I am unwilling to do the small things that nobody sees. And somehow that I can... Get, I can produce the big things that everybody wants. I mean, everybody wants to be the athlete. Everybody wants to be the musician. Everybody wants to be that, that fabulous singer. Everybody wants that. And I, I think the power, when we think about our faith, our faith in a similar way, many of us are trying to rush and we're missing the journey with God. Many of us just want to step in and automatically 
be in a place where someone who's been there 20, 30, 40, 50 years and have sweated and blood and their knees look like feet, you know, because they're on their knees all the time. And those who have gone through the scriptures and, and I tell you, you know, it, it, is, it is absolutely probably one of the biggest things I've seen in the body of Christ today that misses out and why we don't mature and why we don't grow because we're not faithful to small things. And uh, I am absolutely convinced and that's why God instructs us to look at the small things. And I think many of us, like myself, I'm kind of spiritually ADHD, you know. I can't focus. I want to jump into the next thing, you know. I mean, I'm, and I don't give the time and the energy necessary to be faithful at the one thing, the small thing, that I can grow and mature in the other. And so I jump around, I'm here, I'm inconsistent. And then I'm wondering, well, well, you know, why isn't the thing working out? You know, why, am I, why, am I, why is God not answering my prayers? You know, why, why am I constantly bitter and angry? Why, why does my life always seem like a failure? And your life isn't a failure. Not in God's eyes. But maybe under the shadow that you're looking at, you're looking at it, maybe under somebody else's view, you might, that they might be looking at you in that way. Why would you put yourself under the will of a small person? Instead of putting your life in the only one who knows you more than even your own mother knows you, your creator God, who fearfully and wonderfully shaped you and molded you and gifted you and talented you, not for smallness, Matter of fact, when you read the book, you're gonna, you and I find out that God really has purposed you and destined us not to live average, but to live extraordinary. Because we don't serve a God of average. We serve an extraordinary God. And His plans and His purpose for your life is to be extraordinary, to be life-changing. That you and I would take on the mantle that God has given all of His children. That you and I are to be the light and the salt in the community. That you and I are to live a life of influence and authority and power in Christ. In our homes, in our marriages, in our workplace, where we live, work, and play. Too many of us are just barely existing, and we're satisfied with that. We're satisfied with just existing. We're satisfied with just going along. We say, oh, I, I just scraped by. I'm so happy. And I'm not saying that's a bad or evil thing. I'm just saying you were created for more. Your Heavenly Father has a better plan than that. Just existing and getting by, okay? You're living under somebody else's shadow. And I don't know what that is for every individual person, but I do know that when you and I hear His voice and when we encounter the presence of a living God, that all of a sudden those things begin to change in supernatural ways. And our focus goes from worry to contentment, from negative thoughts to positive thoughts. It goes from looking at the world to ultimately looking at eternity. And I want to suggest a few things. So how, how do I get out of this will of small people? How do I get out of that? I want to suggest just a, a, a couple of things. And... One is that one of the, the, the first steps of having a, a, a will, thoughts of a small person, is that too many of us have trash thoughts. And we have to speak truth into those trash thoughts. We need to take those trash thoughts, and as Jesus taught us, we need to capture those destructive thoughts and speak truth. So, when I think of, well, you know, I'm just not smart enough. I'm really, you know, my teachers have told me I'm not really that smart. You know, I, you know, my counselor, my mama, my papa, my aunt, my uncle, you know, the world, my friends. You know, you're not really that smart. You're really not. I, I gotta, I gotta. I have the riches of Christ. When, when. When I get those trash thoughts about, oh, you know, oh, you're ugly, you're no good, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too tall, you're too short, the list goes on and on and on. I got to say, I was perfectly formed by my Heavenly Father. 
and not live under the small will of other people and live under their hopes and their dreams. I need to capture those trash thoughts and speak truth in them. I need to speak truth in the, in the midst of my circumstances. In the midst of my, 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 my poor finances, I've got to realize that I, I, am, I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That ultimately, that my Heavenly Father knows all of my needs and will provide them according to His riches and glory. And my self-worth and who I am is not based on my bank account, my 401k, my pension plan, and how much stuff I accumulate. And i got to get out of that trash thinking of the world and start looking at eternity and say that my life has greater meaning and purpose. And I think too many of us in this room, every man, woman, and child, we're living under the will of small people. Because a lot of who we are, we've gotten from others. And I don't think, I'm just going to give people the benefit of the doubt, that it wasn't because there was malicious intent. I think sometimes incorrectly, we talk small to other people trying to shake them up, but we don't realize the damage that we end up doing. So we need to capture those destructive thoughts, those trash thoughts I'm going to talk, speak truth, and then we need to actually fix our thoughts on Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so I want to, I want to challenge us today. I don't know what trash thought you might have, what small thought you might have, what shadow you're living under, someone else's dream for your life. I don't know what that may be. And I want you to, you and God, you before God, say, okay, I want you to capture that thought this week. And said, no, my, this is not going to be my life destiny. My finance don't shape me. Other people's opinions don't manage my destiny. My sickness, my disease is not going to be the one that's going to mold my life. Whatever that is, whatever thought that you say, well, God can't provide it. I'm just telling you, your God is larger than your circumstance. Imagine the, the, the way that we speak to one another, our spouses, our children. And I want you to, I want you just to, to make a decision today to trust God and his word and to listen, whatever it may be, find it in the Bible. There are so many concordances out there. You can go online, you can Google and say, listen, give me all the biblical scriptures, you know what I mean, on, on, on stewardship or wealth or, or on healing or whatever it may be. And just continue to allow truth come into those areas of life. Because too many of us are living small. When God's called you and me to live great. Simply out of his grace. Not because you and I earned it or deserve it. Simply by the grace and the mercy of God. That your life matters. And that you are actually created by God to be ambassador for him. To be a minister of reconciliation. To be an agent of change. To actually be a history maker and a world changer for the glory of God. Those are the things that God's called you to. And many of us have given our lives and living our lives for trifles. Money, wealth, possession, sexuality, drugs, alcohol, people's approval. The list goes on and on and on. And we're living our lives for trifles. And I'm, most of those things are not bad things. I'm not saying those are bad things. I'm not saying don't, don't even pursue them. In the right context, those are beautiful things. But they should never be the center of your life. You'd be living your life for something that was never meant to satisfy you or give you hope and a dream. It's in our pursuit of our God. So go to the ant and look at the will of small people. Don't fall into that. Capture that thought. I want you to think um, there in verse 6, second part of that passage says, You sluggard. And I want you to consider how powerful words are. Words. Many times, I've heard more times I got fingers and toes, well, it's not a big deal. There are only words. I don't know about you, but there's some times where I've had someone who has said some of the most hurtful things to me. I wish they just would have just punched me in the face. The pain would have gone away quicker. The words there linger. And sometimes when we continue to keep them in our will, in our mind, our thoughts, 
They begin to shape us. I want you to consider that the way that you and I speak will determine how you and I live. See, your thoughts and the way you think flows out of your convictions, which eventually flows out of your life. The Bible says that from our hearts, our mouths speak. And so as we're speaking all this trash all over the place, what ends up happening is that we begin to believe it and live it out. All this trash that we see is terrible. And we don't realize that even though we think words are small, they have unbelievable influence in our life. The way one spouse speaks to another, the way a parent speaks to a child, the way a supervisor or boss speaks to an employee, the way teachers or doctors or lawyers speak to their clients or their students or their pupils, unbelievable amount. And the amount of words, too. I want you to consider in uh, uh, Jonathan, who was uh, King Saul's son, he said in 1 Samuel 14 to his armor bearer, which was a little boy at the time, and he said that it makes little difference to God whether he saves by few or by many. And I think this is an absolute powerful application to the words that we use and how many that we use. And let me give you a backdrop of the, of the story. Here's Jonathan, and basically the Philistines had come out to war against Israel. Israel, the army came out, but they were terrified, and they started hiding in caves. And, and there is Saul underneath the tree with all his generals and leaders, and they have no idea what to do. And Jonathan is so filled with faith. He's not going to live, and he's not going to look at the circumstances and see all the numbers out there, and he says, oh, too much. You know what? Uh, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll never get married. I'll never have a spouse. I'll always be poor. You know what I mean? I'll never have children. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And we believe the massive, you know, uh, uh, numbers against us and, and we look at all the data and we just can't believe our God becomes this small, this small, this small and he can't speak into our life. And Jonathan says, well, you know what? We're going to attack. Jonathan and his little armor bearer, little boy. And he basically says, listen, God, if, if, the, if the Philistines tell us, wait right there, we're going to come to you, then God's not going to give them into our hands. But if they say, come up to us and we'll teach you something, then God's going to give them into our hands. Okay? This whole massive army that you can't count, <laughs> you know, a young man, a little boy. And God did it. God will use two. God will use a small thing. Or God will use a large thing. But I think sometimes we're always convinced that God only uses the large things and doesn't. Use the small things. So, let me just suggest a few things for us. When we're thinking about our words and the amount, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to suggest to you something that has worked for me for many, many years. And um, it was through a lot of pain and failure that I eventually came to this particular point. And I want to suggest to you that if you can't say something helpful, skip it. Don't say it. Okay? Stop the trash talk. Stop speaking all the trash, and then your life following after what you're saying. And you think, well, it really doesn't. Oh, it does. If you can't say something helpful, just skip it. See, I learned this in law enforcement many, many years ago. And I'm telling you, you know, I can't tell you time and time again in all my years in law enforcement, I've had people to come up to me and just say all kinds of the most nasty things and some of them would spit at me, and, you know, and during demonstrations, they'd throw rocks and bottles and all kinds of different things or whatever the case. And then I had this natural tendency, as all this sentiment from the bottom of my pail just start rising up. And I must confess that there were times where I just let it go. And you know what? It never, ever, ever accomplished anything. It never... It never added, it, 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 all it did was destroy. 
And I began to realize, I said, okay, how, how am I, as a believer in God, go out and just let all the, the, the filth in my heart to come out instead of me capturing it and allowing God to use it? And so what I started doing, I said, you know what, I'm just going to say nothing. And you know what I realized? Oh, did that make them angry? Because they wanted to stir me up. They wanted to get me to say something. They wanted me to whatever, and I just smile at them. And it drove them nuts, and I got kind of a sick sense of pleasure out of that. But, but I know God was doing something, you know? If you don't have something helpful to say, skip it. I got the flip side of that principle for you. If you have something positive to say, say it. Don't wait. If it comes up, if your spouse did something, if your children did something, don't let distraction or something else, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them later, and then it later never comes. I'm just going to, I'll tell you, man, we, this one principle would make my life just absolutely wonderful and have a great experience on faith, Facebook if we just skipped all the trash talk. Because, golly, it really doesn't need to be said. It really doesn't have to go out there. It doesn't benefit. So imagine, we think words are small, it doesn't have meanings, it has tremendous amount of meanings. And I want us to consider the fact of just capturing, take that moment and allow God to capture that thought and that saying. Look at the other part of that passage there. It says, okay, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways. Why? Because, to be wise. Here's a, it's to be wise. It's so that you and I would live a life that God would reward. And I'm going to tell you something. This is, it takes an awesome amount of power to stay focused to do this. The power of a focused life produces a life that God rewards. Because if you and I start speaking truth instead of the trash talk, it's amazing how you're going to start seeing your life begin to transform. If you and I begin to skip it or say it, and, you, and be careful in the words that we use, we're going to realize how the course direction of our life is going to change. Let me give you, let me give you an example. If I'm constantly talking bitter and looking at bitterness, what will I find in life? Bitterness. Your life will naturally, course of life will constantly be seeking that. And the problem is we're in bondage and in slavery to them. We don't even realize we're doing it. And then we think the whole world is miserable and this and the other thing. I know, I know. I was in that trap for many, many years. I had no hope in the human condition. In all my years in military and law enforcement, I'm thinking, people can't be saved, man. But I was always looking in that direction. And then when God opened my eyes and I began to read truth, I was like, wow, there is redemption and healing and the beauty and the dignity of what God created, the image of God in humanity. That is what I need to look at. And my world just totally opened up. And it began the small things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something. I, I've always had and innate fear to talk in a public group. Yeah. You go into any of my teachers, I would throw a cow. If you ever ask me to come up front and talk. I mean, I'd throw a desk out. You know, they have to send me off to the, you know, I'd, I'd rather go to the dean's office or the principal's office than to go talk in front of anybody. I get a knot every time I come up here. It goes away real quick now. I remember my, I, I have my first sermon on video. And on video, on cassette. Anybody know what cassette is? Yeah. <laughs> a cassette tape. It was horrendous. <laughs> um, 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 um. I mean, it was like three billion ums. I mean, I don't even know anybody. I, it, blew my, it blows my mind that anybody even comes in here to listen to me. I go, what in the world is that? 
And I'm telling you, it takes just a small faithfulness. And to allow God, and the course of your life begins to change. So the thing that you didn't like, all of a sudden now, you experience great joy and purpose. When I think, when I think of new hope, new hopes are very, very small. Norm and I, and maybe two or three other families, and we meet in our living room. And, and now, now you've got three campuses, we're planning a fourth one, you've got Saturday night, you've got Sunday morning. That's for the glory of God. But I'm telling you, it, it would, I always used to feel very silly standing there and sharing this vision, you know, oh, that, you know, that God... You know, that God has called us, you know what I mean, to, uh, to be a church that's going to be multi-ethnic, you know, multi-congregation that's going to plant churches, you know, God's given a vision, you know, this kind of thing. And I'm thinking, everybody looking at this, there's only like a few people in the, fam- you know, in the room here, you know. And it just, it would always, it would always shock me, you know. And I, 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 I just want you to be encouraged to know that I don't know what it may be in your life, that small thing. And you're thinking, it's such an impossibility. I'm telling you, God's in the business of using small things to accomplish great and extraordinary things. See, but the thing is that you and I need, as we're capturing our thought, we need to lay down our hopes and our dream and our agenda on the cross. And you and I need to pick up God's hope and God's dream and God's agenda. Because this is what I'm, I'm absolutely convinced, that our hope and our dream and our agenda is basically a small people dream. And we're living average. And we're just existing when God wants us to live extraordinary and to flourish. That's why we have to lay it down. I just, I don't believe that you and I have the capacity to be able to see all the nuances of all of eternity and then to set up a plan and a strategy that's going to achieve what that looks like. Many times we settle for second best. Many times you and I are living plan B instead of God's perfect plan. Many times we're so easily distracted or so easily pleased with other things that we just totally miss out. We need to stick to something long enough and master it. Small things are ordained by God because He's a very big God and He's able to produce the outcome in our relationships, in our finances, in our sickness, in the painful circumstances of our lives, God is able. I want you to know the God who's able. And I want you to take that small little God that maybe many of us have, and I want you to have a God who is able to do exceedingly more than what you and I even can imagine. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God that I am desperate for you to know. You know, oftentimes I want us to kind of consider that your life and your destiny is so valuable. And maybe you've never heard that. Maybe nobody's spoken that into your life. But I want you to understand how valuable that the God of the universe when he considered the heavens and the earth and all, and he realized a life without you, that he, that was not an acceptable thing for him. And so he steps out of eternity, and he who was rich became poor. And he who was esteemed and all the angels glorifying him and all of heaven rejoicing became of no esteem. Ephesians 2. He who was equal with God did not choose to be like God, but submitted himself to the Father. And he submitted himself and he became small. And he allowed himself to be beaten on a cross. And he allowed himself for his body to be broken, his blood to be shed, so that he could pay the debt that you and I could never pay back to God so that you and I would never have to be enslaved to smallness, enslaved to average, enslaved to just barely existing, and hopefully I can squeak by. 
but that you have a purpose and a life and a destiny in God that is so great and so awesome and so life-transforming. And he went to the cross so that you and I would have this everlasting life in him and that you and I would reach our potential and our destiny and our purpose in life. Why would we settle for anything less? And see, this is what brings us, I believe, to communion. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, do this in remembrance of me. And you know, it always kind of grabs me that we always look at one tiny little aspect of it. And I'm saying, our God is so huge. And I mean, his love is so deep and so wide and so high and so long. And we realize that the God of the universe, when he says, do this in remembrance of me, what are we remembering? Yes, we're remembering that he lived for us, he died for us, and he rose again. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. But he also came and he died so that you and I would be able to live abundantly. That you and I would, would be able, by the grace of God, to be his hands and feet, his light into the world. That you and I, that our lives matter and have significance that ultimately that we know that all that we have and all that we do comes solely from God alone. And so we remember. Now, the, the impossibility is that to remember everything all at once. And so when I read the scriptures, when I read, I, I like to pull out a characteristic of God and his nature and his beauty and his purpose. And every week, that we, that every time we do communion, I pretty much bring out a characteristic of God that we should remember. I don't constantly go back to the same one thing over and over and over again. You have the Bible for that. But let me, let me encourage you to no end how important it is that when you and I come to this wonderful opportunity, that he invites us to come, and he invites everyone, everyone who has put their hope and their trust and their life in Jesus. Everyone who has come to a place of belief and faith and repentance and salvation in Christ. And let me just tell for some of us here in this room saying, well, Eddie, listen, I'm not really there yet. You know, I, I'm kind of trying to figure out this God thing. I've kind of heard a lot of things growing up. I'm not sure this, any other thing. And it, listen, it's okay. We love you, but I wouldn't want you to take communion and this be a dead, meaningless ritual for you. That's all it would ever be. But for those of us who believe and those of us who realize, okay, Lord, I want you to take the small nothingness of my life. As Isaiah said, here I am, a man of unclean lips and a nation of unclean lips, but use me. When you and I come to communion, when you and I come to the table, we are recommitting our covenant to God and believing him for the outcomes of what he's going to produce. That takes great faith. And I want to encourage you all to do that. Let's all stand. God is here. God knows. And God is able in the circumstances of our lives. And I want you to consider the small things. What it means for you and me to pray. What does it mean for you and me to serve? What it you and me to, to be able to, to steward what God has given us, to trust God for the outcomes. And don't despise small beginnings. We come to communion because Jesus came and he was born a little baby. And we come to this moment because he's born a small little manger. He was born into a family that had no political, social, economic wealth. Matter of fact, they were homeless. They had no place to stay. They had no power, no ability, no anything. Small in society's eyes, small in everything. But man, what God was able to do with that little mustard seed was salvation for the whole world. And I pray and I invite you to come and give your lives to Jesus and trust him for the outcomes and trust him for the circumstances 
regardless of how possible they may be. So as this song is being played, um, feel free to come forward. Those who want to participate in communion, we're going to love you. Whether you don't take, that's okay. But it's an issue of faith. And then hold on. We'll all I could see was the struggle. Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures Wondering how long is this gonna This prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. And I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away. Stain. I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. I'm redeemed. All my life I have been called unworthy. Thank you, Lord, for his body that was broken, his blood was shed for us, for our redemption, our healing. Father, we thank you, Lord, that our lives, Father, matter in you, that you have created us, fearfully and wonderfully made us. Lord, that you have made us in your image. And Father, we didn't earn it, we don't deserve it, we can't work for it. Father, it is simply by the grace and the mercy and the love of God. 
And so, Lord, we come to you in great confidence and assurance in our salvation because of the finished work of your son, Jesus. And I pray, Father, that none of us would live under the yoke or the bondage, Father, of smallness, someone else's dream, Father, to lie the enemy. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you and your purpose. Let's take his body and blood together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. I thank you, Lord, Father, that the gift and the beauty and who they are, and I pray, Father, that you would just touch them, and, Father, that they would encounter you in deeper and greater ways. Father, they would know, Lord, that in you, Lord, they have a rich, wonderful destiny and a life in you, and may they never, ever move away from that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Have a awesome, awesome day. Their courage compels me.